Well, good afternoon again. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you, to be able to present the South Carolina Economic Outlook today. It's an exciting time to be in South Carolina, looking back over the last 10 years uh, of this economic expansion. And I'm going to share some comments with you over the next few moments this afternoon, talking about where we've been in South Carolina over the last several years, uh, where we are in December 2019, and where we are headed into to 2020. And as we really look at the economic data and filter through uh, the positive and the negative metrics that we hear on a regular basis, and especially as we filter through a lot of the political noise that we hear in the news uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I think one question really emerges, and it's a, a good way to, to really get our discussion started this afternoon in terms of uh, the, the main question that really is on everybody's mind when we filter through all of this, uh, all of the news and all the noise that we hear on a regular basis, and that simply uh, is a recession coming in 2020 is a recession uh, right around the corner. Because this is the longest economic expansion on record, going back to, to World War II. We're 11 years in. Uh, this started back in the summer of 2009. And unemployment in South Carolina was 11.6% 10 years ago today, if you, can, if you remember uh, uh, 10 years ago. So uh, South Carolina has come a long way. And so it's a very natural question to ask whether or not the steady job and income growth that we've seen over the last several years, whether that's going to persist into 2020. Is that going to head through another 12 to, to 18 months? So to answer that question, I think it's important first to think through why this, this question of a looming recession has emerged in the last year. This is not something that was uh, bandied about quite as much uh, last year at this time. So what's changed in 2019? I think that's an important, uh, important component to address. Well, there are three major, three major factors that I would suggest that have changed in the last 12 months that uh, we need to pay attention to. Uh, the first is the fact that the tariff effects, as you can see here, are, are now a bit more visible than they were this time last year. So we're now well over a year past the beginning of the ongoing trade disputes and trade negotiations, particularly with, with China. And so now we actually have the data where we can observe the effects and see how it's impacted both the US economy uh, and South Carolina's economy. And we've also learned that these trade negotiations are definitely going to be protracted. It's not, not a short-term phenomenon. And even just uh, this morning, we heard uh, from the president that the, uh, this, these ongoing negotiations with China may persist well into, into 2020. So this is definitely a long-run um, a long run factor that we're having to, uh, have to address. And that's become more and more, we've become more and more aware of that throughout this year. Secondly, we see a tax cut stimulus package uh, that is wearing off in 2019. So recall that we saw a, uh, a major uh, uh, federal tax cut package that was passed in December of 2017 uh, that created stimulus effects both for consumer spending and for uh, private investment as well. Uh, and that has begun wearing off. It, it, it worked its way through in 2018 and is wearing off in 2019. I like to say that 2019 we're experiencing a decaffeinated economy. Right? So the US economy basically drank a Red Bull in the form of a tax cut in, in 2018, and we're coming off of that caffeine high. So if you look at those two effects, and you add into the mix some slowing global demand, which we've also seen, then it's perfectly normal to expect to see a change in uh, policy from the Federal Reserve. And we've actually seen a, uh, a bit of a 180, of course, uh, going from interest rates rising throughout 2018 to the Federal Reserve lowering rates in 2019. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Sarah House will, will talk more about uh, Federal Reserve policy and what we expect for 2020. Uh, but to, suffice to say uh, that these factors have led to a change in course for the Federal Reserve this year. And we can observe this in the data. We can actually see how this has manifested itself. So this is GDP growth, the single best proxy that we have for the health of the, of the national economy. And a couple of things to notice here, this tracks GDP growth over the length of this expansion period. And you notice that really on the, uh, really the, the left side of the graph, so sort of before the first quarter of 2016, a lot more variability in overall growth. So uh, blue bars, uh, uh, tall blue bars, followed by very short blue bars, so a lot of, lot of variability in growth from quarter to quarter. Um, but in recent years, we've seen growth that's been much more stable. Uh, again, blue bars that have been more consistent over time. But we've also seen a bit of a slowdown or a softening of growth in the last year. 2.1% is our latest estimate for GDP growth, and I can put some lines on here, and you can actually see the uh, slowdown that we've experienced in the last 12 months. So essentially a full percentage point 
change in GDP growth from about 3.1% in 2018 to about, again, 2.1% 2, 2 in, in 2019. So we very clearly can see these effects. But here's the key. It depends greatly on which industry you're in in terms of how you're perceiving this slowdown. And in a very real sense, depending on the industry, depending on the business, you may see uh, this economy as a glass half full or a glass half empty because it's very different depending on whether we're looking at manufacturing and manufacturing adjacent industries or whether we're looking at other sectors of the economy, namely uh, the service sector. So that's important to, to distinguish. And it's a bit of a stretch to say that this is really a tale of two economies, but I think that term illustrates the point that we're seeing very different trends, again, depending on which sector uh, that you're observing in 2019. So let's talk a little bit about manufacturing first and how that has played out in the US and how that filters down to, to South Carolina. So very quickly, just to uh, regroup on where things stand with respect to the ongoing trade negotiations, again, I don't wanna get into the uh, the weeds on all the details here because it's changing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but just three primary points in terms of uh, perhaps transition moments that we've observed over the past year and a half. So in early 2018 is when this uh, ongoing uh, uh, set of trade negotiations really kicked off. Uh, we saw uh, about 10% a 10 tariff that was implemented on uh, roughly $250 billion worth of Chinese goods, as you can see here. Uh, that was then followed by retaliatory tariffs on the part of China in the summer, which included a 40% tariff on all U.S. autos that were shipped and sold in, in China. And that had a significant effect on markets here in South Carolina, and I'm going to show you some evidence for that in a moment. Fortunately, that was fairly short-lived. Uh, when we saw that 40% tariff reduced to 15% the following January, which would be January of this year, 2019. Uh, and since then, we've had a lot of back and forth. Again, uh, the, the trade negotiations are evolving on a day-to-day -day basis. And where we stand in December of 2019, we're now looking at this uh, potential phase one trade deal uh, with China that we hear a lot about. Uh, but again, that's evolving on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't know if that's going to be resolved uh, anytime soon. We also know that we've seen a change this year in terms of a slowdown in global growth. And we can observe that directly if we look at uh, some different economies around the world. Um, so I wanna focus on just a couple here. First of all, China. Uh, we can see how their growth patterns have evolved in the last several years. 6% growth is where they are uh, right now, uh, down from about 6.5% growth uh, roughly uh, a year ago. So you can see a bit of a softening of, of demand there. We also see it if we look in the Eurozone. Very different picture in terms of absolute growth rates, of course. Uh, so 6% uh, versus 0.2% uh, here. Uh, but regardless, we see this softening of demand uh, ar around the world. And Germany in particular has been struggling in 2019. Germany actually just uh, barely avoided a recession this year, um, as you can see here. So we were very pleased to see that at least they saw uh, some, some small amount of growth uh, in the third quarter of 0.1%. Of but again, reflects this broader trend at the, at the global level in terms of of softening demand overall. And the reason I bring up China and Germany in particular is because they are the top trading partners of South Carolina. So it's very important to keep in mind and to keep track of what's happening uh, in these two markets, in these two economies uh, especially. And I think a, a nice way to really encapsulate and to, uh, to solidify this difference and how we're seeing effects in manufacturing versus what we're seeing elsewhere uh, is to look at the, the ISM index. This, this really captures what we're talking about in terms of this glass half empty or half, half full phenomenon. So the ISM index is, particularly the ISM manufacturing index, is something that we see a lot, uh, we often see quoted in the news. And this is a metric that gives us a sense of what manufacturing is doing today and what we can expect manufacturing to do in, in the coming months. So it measures things like uh, total output, total employment, delivery times, inventory, a number of different metrics. And then it indexes it such that any metric reported above 50 represents an expansion. Anything below 50 represents a, a contraction. And so if we look at the ISM index here, manufacturing is represented in, in red there. And you can see the, the black line there represents 50, so kind of the cutoff between expansion and contraction. So notice that since 2018, we've seen a bit of a, of a downturn in this particular metric, and it's recently gone below 50. Um, and so, again, the ISM suggests that things are slowing down a bit in, in manufacturing. 
But there's also an ISM index that represents non-manufacturing or represents more of the service sector. And this is represented here in blue. And again, if you look over the last year or so, you can see that this is uh, plugged away at a, or, or has been plugging along at a fairly steady pace. A bit of a softening overall, but still well above 50 and, and plugging away at, at a fairly steady uh, rate of expansion. So again, you can very clearly see here this difference of whether we're looking at manufacturing and manufacturing adjacent industries versus whether we're looking at the broader service sector. We can also see this if we look at uh, actual output numbers. So this just provides a, uh, another, set, another way to actually examine these uh, specific effects. So this looks at gross output by industry. This is not GDP, so this is output. So this is more of a reflection of sales activity. Um, but here broken down again in manufacturing versus the services sector and then all industries. And I would just draw your attention uh, to the difference between the second quarter of 2018 and 2019. Again, all three sectors or the two sectors and uh, the U.S. Uh, gross output as a whole, still doing very well, but a sizable difference here when we look at the softening depending on the sector that we're looking at. So between 2018 and 2019, again, across all industries, we see a drop from 6.5% to 3.5%, so about a 3% change there. For the services sector, about 2.2%, and then you can see for manufacturing close to, close to 6%. So again, very different depending on uh, the industry that we're looking at as a whole. And how does that affect us in South Carolina? So that gives us a sense of these changes at the national level, uh, but in South Carolina, that affects us disproportionately because, of course, South Carolina's growth over the last decade has been primarily tied to, or at least largely tied, to export-oriented manufacturing. So think the automotive sector, the aerospace sector, the tire sector, and others. And so we would expect for South Carolina to be a bit disproportionately affected here. Uh, and we actually do see this. So if we just look at changes in employment growth in South Carolina, uh, we see a softening across the board. But if you compare the US on the left and South Carolina on the right, again, we're still seeing positive growth. But coming back to this term softening, we've seen more of a softening in South Carolina uh, than we have at the national level. Again, because South Carolina is much more, is much more concentrated in, in manufacturing. The percentage of our state's economy devoted to manufacturing uh, is significantly higher than, than the national average. So having said this, we are missing one critical element which explains why the services sector is doing really well and why manufacturing uh, continues to do well despite the fact that we have seen some, some tapering off this year. What is that crucial element that we're missing? And the answer is the labor market. The labor market right now in South Carolina and at the US level is incredibly strong. And the strongest that we've seen arguably in a generation. And I think this graph does a wonderful job of illustrating that point. So this shows us both the US unemployment rate as well as the US job openings rate. So the unemployment rate here is in red, the job openings rate is in blue. And for most of the last 20 years, this graph goes back to 2001, you see that the unemployment rate typically falls above the job openings rate as a whole. But notice what changed really within the last year, year and a half. We saw those two lines cross. So now the job openings rate actually exceeds the US unemployment rate, which means that we have more job openings than we have people available to fill them, more job openings than uh, than people to fill them. So the job openings rate is higher than the US unemployment rate. The unemployment rate at the national level right now is at 3.6%. Unemployment in South Carolina right now is at 2.6%. Let me say that again. Unemployment in South Carolina right now is at 2.6%. And again, 10 years ago, we were talking 11.6% unemployment. So this has been a dramatic change. And the market, in, the labor market in South Carolina is incredibly strong right now and as strong as we've seen it, uh, as I mentioned, in, in, in a generation. Now, why is this important? Well, it has a number of important implications. The most, perhaps the most important one, is the fact that it's putting upward pressure on wages. And we've seen this in South Carolina. We've seen this at the national level. So here's uh, an example of, uh, of that phenomenon. We can see average hourly earnings uh, of employees that have been steadily increasing. Uh, that's been moving in a more positive direction, so the slope is changing a little bit in, in recent years, and close to the level that it was at before the, before the Great Recession began. And even more importantly, we're now seeing that all types of occupation categories are generally seeing wage gains, and those that typically fall on the low end of the pay scale 
are actually seeing wage gains at the fastest rates in terms of the overall growth rates. So in this graph, blue represents all workers looking at uh, wage gains over time, looking at the percentage increase. Red represents um, workers that typically fall on the lower end of, of, of the pay scale. And as you can see, in the last year, uh, those workers have begun to exceed the overall average. So again, very positive news for the U.S. and for South Carolina in particular, uh, because this is the natural response or the natural consequence to a lengthy expansion period as the demand for labor continues to increase over time. We can also see this if we look at this breakdown by uh, education, educational uh, category. Um, so here we have, over time, three different uh, sets of bars here. Green represents all college graduates and the wage growth that they have seen. Uh, red represents just those with a high school diploma. And blue represents professional and technical services, which really includes a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the professions, typically includes most of the STEM fields, uh, some management positions as well. But those are the categories where we typically see high wage growth during an expansion period. And again, notice the change as we move further along into this economic expansion from 2011 to uh, 2019. In the early part of the expansion, you see that the blue bars, again, the areas where we would expect or the workers that we would expect to see high wage growth, uh, far outweighs or far exceeds those for high school graduates as well as for college graduates as a whole, that in green. But in the last two years, we've seen that difference largely collapse. And it's not because blue is going down, it's because the red and green are going up. Once again, reflective of the fact that we're seeing more labor demand overall, that's putting upward pressure on wages, and that's translating into wage gains across the board for occupations across the, uh, across the pay scale. So very good news for workers right now. This is, a, again, a very strong labor market uh, that we're in. And I would suggest to you that this is certainly common, common sense if we look around every day, right? I think many of us see these help wanted signs uh, as we're driving around. I know I certainly do. Driving around the Midlands, Greenville, Charleston, all over South Carolina, uh, we are seeing people looking for work. We're seeing businesses looking for, looking for workers, looking for employees. So I think we see this day to day as we're driving around, as we're interacting with, uh, with colleagues, and the data, of course, point to, point to that same conclusion. Now, a second benefit uh, when we look at the implications of a strong labor market, and that's how this additional, uh, these additional wages that workers are experiencing, that they are earning, how does that translate into economic growth? Well, part of it is the fact that they are spending those wages. And we see that here. If we look at personal consumption, the growth rate has been fairly steady over the last several years. So here, this represents growth. So if you look at this blue line as basically uh, flat horizontally, that, that's a good thing, because that means steady growth over time. So job gains, steady job gains, creates a much tighter labor market, putting upward pressure on wages, creating more disposable income, and leading to more personal consumption. And personal consumption represents the majority of our economy, the majority of GDP, about 70%. So critically important, uh, for this relationship to hold to maintain our expansion as we, as we head forward. And again, as long as we have this strong labor market, it's likely that consumer spending will continue, and we'll continue to see uh, pictures like this of steady growth over time. Note also, I put some lines in here, a couple of arrows there, where you can see kind of the, uh, the tax cut bump from 2018 um, in terms of the stimulus and how we've kind of come off of that in 2019. So again, just reflecting that, the fact that we did see a bit of a change in 2018 and we're experiencing a decaffeinated economy uh, in 2019. The other factor that makes this so important when we look at a healthy job market is it increases both business and consumer sentiment. And in both cases, these are still at, at all-time highs during this expansion period. Uh, you can see consumer sentiment generally been ticking upward uh, fairly steadily and, again, remains at, a, at a, an all-time high during this expansion period. And business confidence remains the same way. If we look at uh, the National Federation for Independent Businesses, this is with the end of the third quarter, uh, they had a report concluding small business optimism declines but remains historically high. Again, that's, that conclusion is basically representing a trend line for business confidence that's pretty much in line with what we're seeing here with consumer sentiment. Yes, it's fluctuating, maybe down a little bit, but overall it's at its highest level uh, during this current expansion period. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about South Carolina and about our outlook and how these trends are affecting uh, what's going on here locally and what we've been seeing. So over the last year, South Carolina has mirrored a lot of the trends that we've seen at, at the national level. We've certainly seen a bit of a softening of growth in South Carolina. We can see this most clearly if we look at employment trends in South Carolina. Uh, so this is employment growth tracked back to 2011. You can see basically three primary uh, breaks in the trends here. So I can put a uh, couple of lines here to help illustrate that. So you can see during the early part of the expansion, uh, a fairly steady increase in job growth over time, largely a response to uh, the fact that we were recovering from the Great Recession. And then secondly, you can see what's happened in the last year to year and a half where we've seen a softening of growth from just over about 2% employment growth in South Carolina down to 1.4%, which is the uh, latest estimate from the data that are available as of, as of October of 2019. So again, not a trend that is dissimilar from these national trends that we've seen in terms of overall GDP growth. So the best way to really get a feel for what is driving this change and therefore what we can look ahead to for 2020 is to look at the breakdown by industry and see what's really been driving these changes in 2019. So where is the softening of this growth? Uh, where has that actually come from? So we can break down these employment trends and look at it, as I mentioned, at the industry level. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat and show you the, the answer here in a moment. But basically, these are the, the major super sectors of South Carolina. And each super sector, each major industry group, uh, we've got graphed here in, in red and blue. So the blue bar represents the growth for each industry over the last four years. The red bar represents growth over the last 12 months. And what we do in this exercise is we want to see which industries have seen the most significant change from going from the blue bar to the red bar. So where have we seen the most change, the most deviation from really the longer, uh, uh, the longer term rate of growth for each industry sector? And then we wanna think more about uh, what's been driving that, what's been behind it. Well, as I mentioned, we can cheat here. We don't wanna go through each one of these, of course. Um, but let's highlight the ones that have made the most, uh, have contributed the most to the slowdown or the softening of growth that we've seen in South Carolina uh, in the last 12 months. And it turns out there are two primary uh, industries that, that I wanna talk a little bit more about here. Manufacturing is one, uh, and construction is, is the other. So here you can see two, uh, uh, four arrows, but they're in two separate colors. So if we look at black first, you can see that construction on the left there is linked to financial services, which is kind of in, in the center there. And the reason I put those two together is because even though we've seen a slowdown in, in financial services, that's primarily driven by changes in overall construction activity. Because if you drill down in to the financial services sector, what we find is that that's primarily uh, uh, insurance activity related to, related to real estate, which falls into that financial services category. So the change in financial services really can be linked back to construction. So that's one major sector that we want to talk about. The other one is manufacturing. And here we link together manufacturing, which is the green arrow on the left, and professional and business services, which is the green arrow on the right. Now, why would we do that? Why would we link those two together? Well, it turns out that professional and business services, which by itself is just this large industry category that really doesn't mean too much, if we actually break it down, we can see where this change in this major sector has come from this year, and it comes from a change in employment services or what we uh, typically know of as, as contingent labor placed through, through staffing firms. And the reason that's important and pertains to manufacturing is that for many manufacturers, their business model is partly, uh, part of their business model is hiring workers both directly and more indirectly through staffing firms. They have a contingent workforce as well. And that's to allow them to have, to maximize their flexibility as demand ebbs and flows over time. So it's just a natural part of, of, of their industry. But as a result, when we see changes in how they are increasing or decreasing their contingent labor force, that's gonna be hidden in the data if we just look at manufacturing. So we have to include this extra piece. So we have to scratch a, a bit of, uh, beneath the surface when looking at the data to really get a handle on what's going on in manufacturing in South Carolina. So that's why we lump those two together because it turns out that much of this change in the last year that's occurred in professional and business services is the result of a change in this employment services sector or that 
dealing with contingent labor as a whole. So let's briefly talk about manufacturing, and then we'll briefly talk about uh, construction. So getting back to manufacturing and its effects on South Carolina, and looking at some of the evidence for what we've seen over the last year, uh, first this question of how these tariffs, and especially the auto tariffs, have been affecting uh, our state. How can we begin to think about that, and where are we seeing evidence for it? Well, first of all, we can really break down the potential effects of any tariffs in South Carolina into short-run and long-term impacts. So the short-term impacts basically refer to uh, a series of, of price increases or an increase in, in production costs. So if we see an increase in the tariffs on auto parts that are being imported into the United States, that basically translates into an increase in production costs for manufacturers, uh, ultimately leading to price increases for, for the final good, typically, or it's, or it's absorbed, one of those two. But either way, we're seeing an increase in costs overall. Secondly, any type of retaliatory tariff that we see on the part of China or anyone else means that we're going to see an increase in the price of the, final, uh, of the final vehicle itself. And in both cases, when we see an upward pressure on prices or we see an increase in price, what does that do? That's going to tamp down demand and, and blunt, some of, uh, blunt some of the demand that, that these companies are seeing. Now, the good news is that any particular uh, positive outcome to these trade negotiations would alleviate any real short-term effects almost, almost instantly, right? Because we're just talking about a, a price shift there. But we also have to consider these long-run effects. And the long-run effects can occur when companies, in order to avoid a lot of the either the tariffs themselves or the uncertainty surrounding the potential for future tariffs, in order to avoid that, they begin to rethink their production decisions and where they're going to produce uh, uh, vehicles for different markets. And if they're going to produce them for markets outside the United States, does that mean they want to uh, rethink their global production strategies? And what we're looking at in South Carolina right now is whether or not or when we see any type of short-run effects begin to transition into long-run effects. And I would suggest that the longer that we see the ongoing uncertainty associated with trade negotiations, uh, the more likely we're going to see these short-run effects uh, translate into or turn into long-run effects. But again, every individual company is different, um, so it's hard to say specifically uh, what that time frame actually looks like. Now, what do the data show us for South Carolina in terms of what we've seen over the last year? A couple of points that we can make here. Uh, first of all, if we look at South Carolina uh, export volume, this is uh, cargo volume shipped out of, of Charleston, uh, you can see that there's a very strong uh, impact here that occurred in the second half of 2018 uh, as a result of that retaliatory tariff that China implemented. Remember, we mentioned before a 40% tariff on uh, vehicles exported out of the United States that went into play or went into effect in July and then was reduced back down to 15% in January. And again, a very strong correlation here with export activity uh, that we see in terms of export growth uh, that dropped significantly during the second part of 2018 and has been recovering since then. And notice that even though total cargo volume, um, which is uh, graphed in blue here, has been tracking export volume overall very closely, that the second half of 2018 and into early 2019 is really the only time that that pattern has, has deviated. So total cargo volume has stayed positive, uh, but exports were affected uh, during that time period. And again, that reinforces this uncertainty. Could something like this uh, potentially happen again uh, if we see additional tariffs uh, going forward? So a lot of uncertainty, uh, which is right now uh, having, some, having some real effects in, in South Carolina. The other piece of evidence that we can see in the data uh, that have emerged over the last year, it goes back to this manufacturing uh, employment data uh, that we have that we can take a look at. And we can very clearly see a change in this employment services category. Again, getting back to, to uh, the contingent labor. So here, blue represents manufacturing employment growth over time. Again, this tracks it back to 2013, fairly steady. Uh, if we look at green, that represents advanced manufacturing or transportation equipment manufacturing. Basically, green represents the automotive sector, the aerospace sector, uh, and the tire sector and, and related, uh, related industries. So you can see, again, a bit of a tapering off in the last year. But if we focus on employment services, you see a major change. And again, this is because a lot of these companies are waiting out. Uh, are hoping to wait out these, these tariff negotiations, these trade negotiations, uh, to see what the, what the end game is. Uh, but that's definitely having an effect in South Carolina right now. Also notice, however, 
that despite the fact that this has been happening for over a year, what do we notice about the unemployment rate? It's continued to fall, right? So we've had no adverse effect on unemployment as a result of this, which implies that the labor market is so strong that many of these workers are getting absorbed elsewhere in South Carolina. So again, another, another reason why it's so important that we have a strong labor market right now, a very strong jobs market uh, in South Carolina. The other sector that we want to talk about that's changed over the last year, in addition to manufacturing, I'll briefly talk about construction. Uh, you can see the trends here. This graphs uh, employment changes back to 2016. And again, we see a very similar pattern here uh, as we saw with the, with the export data in terms of a, a bit of a, a softening of growth or downturn in 2018, followed by a recovery in 2019. And this is true whether we're looking at new construction, which is graphed here in blue, uh, or remodeling, which is graphed in red. But the reason for this change is, of course, very different from what we've seen in manufacturing. And that's because in late 2018, we effectively had uh, the perfect storm occur in housing, which caused a blunting of the momentum that housing had seen for the last several years in terms of steady growth. And that perfect storm consisted of three elements an increase in labor costs, an increase in lumber costs, as you can see here, and an increase in interest rates. Now, anyone in construction will tell you that some of the largest costs that they face come from labor and lumber, so you would expect that two of those going up, of course, is gonna put upper pressure on, on prices, is going to uh, uh, tamp down demand, and of course, an increase in interest rates is going to make it marginally less affordable for the home buyer, and we saw interest rate rates rise uh, steadily in, in 2018. The good news is that two of these three factors have basically been removed from contention as being threats in 2019, which is why we've seen uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a recovery, specifically lumber costs and, and interest rates. So lumber costs were going up for uh, a couple of years since 2017 uh, because of an ongoing trade dispute unrelated to uh, the the current trade negotiations that, are, that, that we hear about with, with China and others in the news, but this was a softwood lumber debate with, with uh, Canada, and something that's been going on for a number of years that preceded the current administration and flares up every, every now and again, and makes lumber prices, or can make lumber prices, fairly volatile. Um, and so we saw a significant increase between 2017 and 2018, uh, which, of course, accompanied by increases in labor costs because of a strong job market, uh, created some negative effects on, on housing. And of course, interest rates in 2019 uh, have not been much of a factor or as much of a factor this year, simply because we've seen a change in, in uh, Fed policy. Of course, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the federal funds rate and mortgage interest rates, uh, but they are, they are correlated. So if we look at the three, two of these three are not as much of a factor in 2019. And just briefly going through the data, I'll show you some examples of this. You can see uh, lumber prices over time, about a 17% increase. You can see it come back down uh, in, the last, uh, in the last year or so, which has had a positive effect. And then, of course, mortgage interest rates have come down as well in 2019. Again, very positive for the housing market overall. And so as we look ahead into 2020 in housing, in terms of whether or not the housing markets across South Carolina will remain stable, uh, one good way to see this is if we look at the FHFA, which is the uh, house price index that allows us to see appreciation, the rate of appreciation over time. And you can see here, again, this represents another graph where we're looking at growth. So a flat horizontal line actually rep represents a positive trend because it represents slow and steady growth. Um, so you can see whether we're looking at South Carolina as a whole or whether we're looking at markets within South Carolina. Uh, here we have graph Charleston, Columbia, and, uh, and Greenville, Spartanburg. Things look pretty steady overall. So housing is looking good going into to 2020, despite the fact that we saw that a bit of a blip in late 2018, basically because of that perfect storm that emerged in the second half of, of, of last year. A couple of final comments then. As we head into the forecast of what we're looking at for 2020, uh, this represents a regional map of growth over the last 12 months. And I'm not gonna talk as much about what's going on regionally. Dr. Woodward's gonna talk about that later. Um, but here, at the very least, you can see the major counties that have been driving our growth over the last 12 months. The dark green counties represent the areas that have seen the most growth. Notice that there are no red counties on here at all. 
So all 46 counties in South Carolina have seen positive job gains in the last 12 months. The other interesting factor here to look at is that if we look at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, and Charleston, where we have the red stars there, notice that for the most part, none of them are in dark green. None of them are in dark green. That's a bit unusual. That's the first time that's happened in this expansion period. And it's happening basically for two reasons. Number one, we're seeing the more rural areas of South Carolina begin to catch up because this economic expansion, as it continues, it's filtering through to other regions of South Carolina. And secondly, we're beginning to see a labor shortage emerge in South Carolina because we have such a, a strong labor market now. And in many cases, what we're seeing in the major metropolitan regions is that companies see demand, but they simply can't find, find the people. So it's very hard to see employment growth rates that we have experienced over the last several years. It's very hard to see them continuing at their current rates. So it's not necessarily a surprise that we'd see a bit of a softening in these regions in, in South Carolina. So what is our forecast for 2020? Our, our outlook for the unemployment rate going forward, as I mentioned before, slower growth is what we're anticipating, uh, but no recession in, in 2020. So our unemployment rate forecast, we anticipate that unemployment will remain at approximately 2.6%. You can see the quarterly estimates here uh, over the next year. Again, not really much room for the unemployment rate to drop. And the labor shortage in South Carolina and to a certain extent in the U.S. as well is going to continue to become more of a pressing issue and limit our growth going forward. Because even if we see, for example, a positive resolution to these ongoing trade disputes and we see a significant scaling up of activity, uh, we have to find the people to be able to do that. Um, and that's, that's going to be an issue that South Carolina continues to face. Our outlook for employment growth for 2020, 1.5%. Uh, that's down from what we've seen over the last 24 months where employment growth has averaged about 2%. Uh, again, a softening of growth is what we anticipate continuing into the new year. Uh, positive growth, but not at the rate that we have seen in 2019 or, or certainly in 2018. And then finally, our forecast for uh, total personal income growth for 2020, we expect that to continue to tick upwards to about 5.6% overall average for, for 2020. Um, again, a very strong market for workers, and we expect to continue to see these great wage gains uh, across all occupation types, uh, including those at the, at the lower end of the pay scale um, in 2020. So we continue to move ahead uh, and see the positive benefits associated with this labor market as a whole. So our bottom line as we wrap up, slower growth, as I mentioned, for 2020. No current uh, recession uh, expected. Now, a recession is more likely today than it was one year ago, um, and that's primarily because lower growth always means that any given shock is more likely to derail our expansion. Um, so that is, is, is fairly normal. Uh, but again, right now, we are not expecting that. We see continued slower growth in 2020. Uh, our economy has remained very resilient uh, in the face of these economic headwinds uh, and these, these trade shocks, but the labor shortage will continue to be a bottleneck for growth. So is it possible to get to employment gains that were the level that we were seeing even two or three years ago? That's, it's really hard to see how we get back to that, how we get back to that level. So that's certainly a, uh, uh, an issue that South Carolina will continue to have to address. But these lower employment gains, as I mentioned, will lead to higher wage, grade, uh, higher wage growth in the new year uh, as well. So still a very strong market for South Carolina workers as a whole. And the last statement to really sum this up is that when we look ahead 18, 12 to 18 months from now, after 2020 is over, and we look back and compare 2020 to 2019, I think we'll say that 2020 was a good year, but probably not quite as good as 2019. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.